so we have talked already today about what is happening or not happening at the federal level and how that's driving state behavior and how the space between the federal and the state governance is being shaped. So now with our third panel, we're going to turn our attention to the relationship between state governments and localities. So as states take greater responsibility to drive policy and programs, how does that change service delivery and other roles at the local level? And Dr. Bill Resch is going to be moderating this distinguished panel. Dr. Resch earned his doctoral degree at American University's School of Public Affairs in 2011. He was a tenure-track assistant professor in public management at Indiana University School of Public and Environmental Affairs uh, from 2011 to 2014 before joining the University of Southern California's Price School in Public Policy in 2014. His research focuses on public management and executive politics, and a common theme in his work is how administrative structure and political environments affect the behaviors, perceptions, and working relationships of civil servants. So please join me in welcoming Bill Rush. My biography pales in comparison to our panel here. Um, and so there are pages upon pages of their accomplishments within this. And to save some time for more substance of the conversation, I'm going to uh, not introduce you. I feel that they'll probably weave uh, their experience uh, within the answers uh, to the questions that I'll be posing. And that's the wonderful thing about being a moderator is I just have to ask questions. I don't have to have answers. Uh, but I am very pleased to be here with uh, you four gentlemen. So um, earlier today, I looked at the Trump administration's uh, website for the Office of Intergovernmental Affairs. Uh, seven months in, it said, check back soon for more information on the website. Uh, but as, we, as we've heard from the uh, previous panels, uh, California and other states are not waiting to check back soon. The sixth largest economy in the world is going forward. Uh, with job creation, college graduates, new patents, uh, leading in green technology. And uh, research has shown that economic growth in California is actually the number one driver of uh, the U.S. economic co uh, recovery since 2008. But there's still obviously problems uh, within our state and at the state level. There's vast disparities in health there's vast dis uh, disparities in wages, in income, uh, opportunity, access to social and environmental justice. As uh, one of my favorite political slogans of the last 20 years uh, said, the rent is still too damn high. Uh, but problems are not addressed unilaterally, right? We are uh, addressing them through the complex of our intergovernmental system, uh, the disconnectedness between the layers of our federal system, especially considering the dysfunction that's evident in D.C., uh, provides both problems and opportunities at state and local levels. Now, the uh, previous panels looked at these problems from a more specific policy perspective, and so we're going to step back a little bit in this conversation uh, from more of a structural, institutional uh, perspective. So let's begin uh, first with some of those challenges that I was alluding to. For instance, uh, given the reductions in federal spending, uh, the proposed uh, rather drastic cuts, and also all the continued fiscal pressures on governments at all levels, how have states responded? How has California responded? How has Nevada responded? How have uh, and what do you see as takeaways in terms of good things, in terms of those responses, as well as bad things? First of all, I, I, would, I would look at the most fundamental issue that the federal government faces, the state government faces, and that local government faces, um, and, and that's the issue of uh, fiscal stress. Uh, it was stated well um, by William Pound uh, when he recanted some of the statistics. Um, I've spent the last 10 years at the Price School uh, combining the work that, the 32 years of work that I did at SCAG, uh, looking at long-term um, forecasts and the, techno and the approaches to long-term forecasting um, with this issue, which has been my research area while I've been at, at USC. 
And and basically, what I found, uh, and I I wrote I I've since written this into a book which just came out this last April called The Puzzle of the American Economy. Uh, and what I basically found was, um, just as demographics helps us to plan long term in our region, if you look long term at the fiscal health of our governments, uh, it helps explain what in fact is happening. Uh, and and what I was able to do using large data sets and econometric aggregation models, what I was able to do uh, is to look at what the effect of one variable in demography, namely the age of the various demographic cohorts, what effect that is having on three things. The income of the country, the amount of consumption that uh, occurs within the country, and thirdly, and why I got into this, uh, the taxes paid to all levels of government, um, particularly by individuals, and individuals make up 90% of all government's revenues. Um, and, and essentially what I found um, that was really disturbing. Um, and, and in essence, the substantial increase in the amount of aging population, 64% of all the growth in our population from now forward for the next three decades will be over 65. And furthermore, the working age population, its growth is only a, is a third less of what occurred in the last uh, century. And when you look at what happens as we age, incomes increase as when we're working, we reach 55 and all of a sudden incomes go down, consumption goes down and taxes paid goes down. And when you aggregate that, um, the results were more than, as I said, more than startling. Essentially what is happening between the year 2000 and 2015 is that the decline in income aggregated to $2.7 trillion. I mean, that's income that would have been earned, um, and, and put aside all your business cycles, it would have been earned in the country. Uh, to put this on an annual basis, uh, last year it was $688 billion, which is twice the growth in the GDP. And then consumption followed from uh, the, the decrease in income, but the startling issue for government is that government revenues, aggregate revenues to all levels declined by $288 billion, which is 13% of all of the income paid by individuals. And I track this with the Bureau of Economic Analysis, uh, which tracks these variables, and by golly, in, in 2000, the growth in all personal related taxes was 3.8% per year, in the year 2015, it was 1.7% per, per year. And when you look forward, we're just beginning the cycle of retirees, of 10,000 people per day retiring and less people coming into our workforce. The unemployment going from 10% down to 4% doesn't, it's not surprising given the reduction in, in these factors. So w when I take a look, when I respond to the question, Bill, that you posed, and I listened to the panel this morning talking about fiscal issues as it relates to environment, fiscal issues as it relates to health care. Uh, when I listened to uh, Bill Pound talk about what's happening to the various states um, and what we see going forward, unquestionably something is going to give. And I'm just going to conclude with the following observation. When your income in the country is going down, the consumption is going down, do you expect that we're going to be able to politically raise taxes? And I don't care, you know, take all 14 taxes that we all pay. Are we going to be willing to, in fact, pay more? And I'm including internet sales taxes, et cetera. Put all form of taxation, there will be continued stress. So what that really means going forward uh, is that we're going to have to look to a different strategy. Uh, and we, we, we can answer that in other questions, but the strat I mean, the issue of governance and how we organize ourselves, um, if, if you look at, at all of economic and political theory and people who've written about that, that's the place we need to go. I'm going to start in a different place because um, I feel a little bit like, uh, so I used to work at the National League of Cities before coming to my current organization. I feel a little bit like the local government representative on the panel, so I'm going to kind of raise that up a little bit. But... Um, part of the answer to your question, I think, is 
But we always, the sort of latest term of art for how state and local governments respond to change in business cycles is about, you know, their resilience, right? Their ability to respond or bounce back. And we're certainly going to be talking about that a lot in Houston uh, for a number of years going forward. And so the question of resilience really does come back to fiscal capacity, right? What's the fiscal space available to state and local government leaders uh, when uh, some sort of shock happens, whether it's uh, some sort of external shock they can't control or whether it's some sort of public policy shock. And um, California is making a lot of great progress on a lot of fronts, um, and I think we'll continue to do that um, going forward. But the reality is the size of the potential shocks, whether you're a state government or a local government, is so large that the space just isn't there, right? I, I, to, get, to take example, the state of California, if anything like the repeal of the Affordable Care Act were to happen, would blow somewhere in, in in the next 10 years, it would come to an annual level of over $30 billion, and that's on a budget of $180 billion, right? The, the state can't afford, no matter how much progress it's made, no matter if it's uh, voters have raised income tax rates on the wealthy, the state can't afford that size of a hole. And very similarly, at the local government level, while California is making a lot of progress on kind of state policy fronts, there hasn't been any effort in the current period of kind of sustained economic growth and uh, pretty stable, co uh, reasonable political leadership to address the longstanding problems in the state, which are about state and local government relations and the fiscal capacity of local governments. Our local governments essentially don't have any ability to decide to work with their voters to tax themselves. Um, and to be able to sort of say, look, we'd like a higher level of services here, or we think we need to be more resilient in the face of future shocks. Uh, they just don't have that authority. So while we're making some progress, uh, we're not addressing some of those core issues. And California is doing better than other places. The actual trend in state and local governmental relations that's most concerning around the country is preemption. Uh, there's just been this dramatic rise in preemption activity as state legislatures, largely in red states, uh, are preempting the authority of blue uh, of blue cities, of progressive cities, to tax themselves, to raise their minimum wages, to create municipal broadband, to invest in their own infrastructure. Um, that's a harmful trend in the sort of sense of we ought to be at least going the other direction instead of saying, look, the state doesn't have the capacity to help you in the case of shock, but we're going to give you some flexibility and some space uh, to address your own challenges, and we're seeing the trends actually go in the opposite direction. My experience uh, is that, personally, is that in at least three different states, California being the most recent, but I want to draw a little bit on the Midwest as well. Uh, one of the things that uh, has occurred over the past period of time in my uh, various roles interacting with state government in particular is that uh, there's been a huge uh, expansion and growth in uh, spending on criminal justice in a way that has put pressure, financial pressure, on almost the entire rest of the uh, government. Uh, I remember in Michigan, where it was a very small portion of state revenue, and you know, 10 years later, it was one of the big uh, top three, four spenders in the state. Uh, the second is pensions. Uh, I don't, you know, California has had some pension difficulty with this. There have been some cities in California that have gone bankrupt uh, over their unfunded pension liabilities. I moved here from Illinois. Illinois is probably the worst state in the country, but it's on a relative scale. Uh, they have, states have been investing uh, in committing to pension benefits that they haven't been funding uh, over many, many years. And uh, that is a huge uh, problem. Uh, not only uh, in Illinois, but in many places around the country and many localities as well. And that's a second big fiscal pressure uh, that states and localities have. The third is the dramatic growth, and this is related to Mark's point about the demography, is the dramatic growth in health care spending. Uh, the state match through Medicare, uh, Medicaid in particular uh, has grown way above the inflation rate and above the growth in the economy. And to the point that it's become, uh, you know, al along with education, the uh, big spending item in the state. And then the finally is uh, education itself. Uh, you know, the biggest 
portion of state budgets often, besides those ones I just mentioned, is really education funding. Uh, surprisingly, California is not even, and I don't even know if it's in the top half of per capita funding on education, uh, but it's uh, still a, a huge part of the budget. Uh, and these kind of programs uh, have put financial pressure on, on most states. Uh, and I, we feel this particularly in higher education. Uh, I remember, you know, I'm in a private uh, university now, but most of my career was spent in a public uh, universities. Uh, with the dramatic growth in healthcare spending and with the dramatic growth in criminal justice spending on prisons, et cetera, you could almost see a direct correlation with that and the decline in spe you know, spending on higher education. And it's partly because higher education is a discretionary part of the budget, whereas these other things, especially uh, healthcare spending, is entitlement spending. And uh, it's, it's not you know, discretionary on any sort of given year. So it had a dynamic to it that drove out spending uh, from higher education. Uh, I've uh, been um, also you know, very cognizant, especially moving to California at the tax rates that exist, and Mark alluded to this. Uh, it's been, a, in some ways, interesting that um, Los Angeles has actually increased taxes uh, over since I've been there, primarily for infrastructure spending. But the, um, the potential for that is relatively small. Uh, because California and several, you know, already has a very high income tax. Uh, the state, the cities have very high uh, uh, um, sales taxes, property taxes, uh, on top of the federal tax. And so that on the revenue side adds a hugely important constraint in the mix of these very strong uh, spending pressures that I, that I mentioned earlier. And it's the combination of those things that I think is is really driving the, the um, fiscal stress of both states uh, and, and locality. Just a little bit about myself. I'm a former child welfare, ran the child welfare system for the state of Nevada, and I was county executive down in Clark County. So kind of coming from, it from both a state perspective as well as a county uh, perspective. And the fiscal challenges really don't bode well for a lot of the relationships between state and local governments. I mean, it's both political in that has been alluded to before, many states or most states are actually run um, either at the governor level or the legislature by Republicans, and, and the cities are progressive Democrats. And uh, the number of preemptive laws from everywhere from you can't do a past, you can't charge for a plastic bag, and if you do, we're going to take money away from you. But it's also philosophical, right? In that, how much power do we give cities and, and to allow them to tax and, and, and home rule? And I think across the United States, that's probably been eroding, particularly on fiscal crisis, because when states obviously have are facing these catastrophic fiscal shortfalls, they sweep the general budgets of local governments, right, in order to uh, to um, deal with their their fiscal issues. So uh, you know, th those larger intractable issues, we, we really have to kind of struggle with ways of how we. Um, can deal with these shared wicked problems, whether it be criminal justice that spans between state, federal, and local that has been alluded is consuming all these um, uh, resources to really deep discussions that the cost of government is rising. I mean, uh, unless we get a handle on our pension unfunded liabilities, um, we are delivering less services. It's costing more. Uh, and... Um, the number of employees per 1,000 residents is decreasing, and it has been decreasing for years. Um, so we really have to figure out ways in which everybody has a sh shared skin in the game in order to try to reach some movement on some of these very, very difficult, intractable issues. Um, and, and that's it's, it's, it's obviously not easy. Um, but unless we do, it's just going to continue to uh, exacerbate and get worse. If, if I might just add an additional comment. Uh, when my publisher came came to me and I had written an article and said, would you write this into a book? I said, no. I said, I do not want to have Debbie Downer be on my tombstone. Um, and, the, and the publisher said, well, then spend half the book on what you think we should do about it. And, and one of the early recommendations that, that, that 
I put forward is a is a recant of what you said, and Tom, and that is is that the state of California is making some incredible advances in the area of governance and finance um, in the last several years, um, and this is using Jack the research that I learned at the with my colleagues at the Price School, and we worked uh, through California forward, um, and when when Governor Jerry Brown, you'll like this, uh, said, gee, I want to do something with this tax increment finance stuff of redevelopment, uh, we just jumped on it. Um, and we worked with his Department of Finance, and, and out of that came in two successive sessions, two bills, um, um, and called the Enhanced Infrastructure Financing District, and the second bill, the boards of these districts are pu called public finance authorities. And I want to deal with the bills in reverse order. The, the public finance authorities are set up by cities or counties. Um, and the reason cities and counties take the lead because land and value capture and tax increment is a part of the financing structure. Uh, but they can put any governmental entity on the board of that district and that, and that board member has shared power uh, within that board. So you can create new governance structures based on investment and based on bringing revenues to the table. Uh, and it allows us to integrate various specialized governmental entities that heretofore have their own separate stovepipe funding and there's very little synergy in the investment. And I can be specific in water and transportation, et cetera, uh, housing, you name the issue. Um, the funding part of the of these public finance authorities is equally as interesting in that it has the entire legislative authority code uh, as long as that uh, financing provision has a nexus relationship. If it doesn't, then it's a tax in this state, given our proposition. And then the final provision is that it has tax increment financing. And what I was able to learn in my work at a, at a regional level is that the amount of increased wealth that we have literally given away from zoning policies, from infrastructure investments, from environmental mitigation, when you start to quantify it, um, a small increment of that tax is, is larger than the current tax base. And let me repeat that. It's current than the larger tax base. Uh, and we now have three districts that have just formed. They were the easy ones. Uh, small uh, small cities with small pieces of geography, um, and each of them have invest investment programs of $1.5 billion over the next uh, 45 years. Now, there's 40 other districts um, that are in formation. Some of them are very large. Jan Perry, who is here, is working on the LA River. Um, there's other investment programs that range in the 8 to 10 to $20 billion investment stream. Uh, and this is for all expenditures, capital investment, operation and maintenance, et cetera. And, and furthermore, public-private partnerships can be formed and there's very flexible procurement provisions. It's the kind of governance, innovation and reform that in fact I, I think could literally uh, snowball if, if, if within our own state and hopefully uh, we'll be successful on it and others can learn from us. Um, could, could I have one more thing about uh, the fiscal dynamic, uh, not only in California but elsewhere? And uh, in California, it's it's uh, exacerbated by the fact of the nature of the tax system. Uh, we uh, because we rely rely so heavily on the income tax and the corporate tax. Um, when the economy does really well, as we're doing now, the state does very well. But uh, when it goes into a recession. It does very poorly, poorly, and we haven't been able to balance that out or create um, rainy day funds that are politically protected enough to be able to uh, to deal with that. And over time, that, what that does is it creates a you know a, a spending level that goes up to the maximum spending during the good times, and it's very hard to cut it uh, during the bad times. And other states have faced that same kind of dynamic, uh, and as you know, again over time, it kind of ratchets it up uh, because of the tax system, um, and then uh, it gets cut somewhat uh, during the 
you know, the, the downturns in the economy, but not as much. And so uh, over time, that creates fiscal pressure, I think, uh, at the state level, especially in California. Um, the second is, you know, my experience, uh, especially in the area of education, and when I was in Michigan, uh, local control over uh, financing of local schools was uh, removed from local jurisdictions uh, and given to the state, and then a, the jurisdictions would get a per capita amount. Back then, it's you know I don't know I don't remember the exact amount. It was five to seven thousand dollars per student, uh, and California's done that as well. Uh, the challenge with that is, is then that um, K-12 education becomes a competitor with all the other uh, needs and demands in the state budget. And it suffers over time. And uh, it, the, you know, the, the value in trying to do it at the state level is to create greater equality between rural areas and inner city areas and you know, wealthy areas so that you don't have this tremendous inequality as that's generated by the property tax. But the property tax used in this regard, at least from my experience, uh, you know, when I was uh, in uh, Michigan and Illinois, uh, was a real driver of a high quality investment and spending on education. And uh, Michigan, I thought, did this a little better than California in that they, al they allowed the local governments, uh, the local tax districts, to increase property tax if they wanted to up to a certain amount in addition to the, you know, the, uh, the per capita amount spent by the state. So it wasn't purely just uh, done, uh, done at the state level. But um, th that, I also think, uh, is one of the explanations for why California uh, doesn't spend as much on K-12 education as some other states because it funds it at the state level. And um, it, there's a lot of bu other budgetary pressures on, 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 that, on that money. Yeah, so we, we focused quite a bit in the conversation about constraints. And as Mark said, we don't want to be all doom and gloom. And uh, Mark brought uh, one potential solution or at least one nice framework for cooperation amongst uh, local governments in terms of the TIFs, right? But there are other frameworks that exist. Um, uh, the necessity for co-production, the necessity for these private partner, uh, private public partnerships is there. It's uh, been talked about all day. But how are we, and what frameworks are available to us uh, that facilitate this cooperation amongst localities, amongst, as you said, Many of these local jurisdictions do not have the incentive to look past their nose, right? And these are not going to address those wicked problems because these environmental economic issues do not stop at the jurisdiction's door, right? And so how do we get, how do we facilitate from the state level more cooperation amongst the localities and what frameworks exist or what mechanisms exist for us to get there? Um, uh, to get more cooperation and solve these "quote unquote" wicked problems, I'll, I'll just start with just some ideas. I mean, some can be just plain and simple leadership on an issue. Uh, I just noticed, take Nevada. You know, I'm from Arizona and Nevada, but in Nevada, what the, the governor has done over the last is um, six term. I mean, um, uh, legislative sessions is he's chosen one issue and try to get a consensus and direction around issues, whether it's workforce development, K through 12, higher education. And he's, he selected this, involved some of the main entities to talk about what are some of the shared goals and some of the shared metrics as far as moving the needle. Uh, the other area that was touched upon earlier that I think deserves a lot more attention is that how do we develop more relationship building? We have some of that with state legislators because they work together, but we have very little of that between state legislators and local leaders. Um, a very, not many opportunities for those individuals to actually have opportunities to develop those relationships so when they deal with tough issues that they can uh, make a little progress. And then uh, I know that we develop much more with a mark, but, you know, the, uh, and then we have other tools that we probably underutilize a lot, like a joint purchasing agreements and contracts that really force local and state governments to start thinking a little globally than just in, in their own silos. But we really do need to be looking at these these new type of infra shared governance structures that people have skin in the game. I mean, we're, we're, we're siloed in that our 
finances and our HR systems don't lend itself to working together. They just don't. And we were, we were in these archaic systems. And, and when we try to cooperatively work together, it's, it, it doesn't work because no one has the same skin in the game in dealing with those outcomes. So I think we really need to push that. And the last thing is I think we need to have some really tough conversations about issues, um, as I mentioned, about the cost of government, about whether state and local governments are prepared for the new workforce. I and mean, our systems are not set up to attract the type of people we need coming in with governance. But even issues, and this might seem a little rambling but and off track, but like even economic development, the amount of time we spend from a state level in every single jurisdiction having their own head of economic development and, you know, just being honest about how we count that, it's robbing Peter to pay Paul. And when one city makes their tremendous gains, it's just because they stole it from the city next door. And everybody's triple counting and there's not an honest discussion about how we're actually moving the needle on the issue of bringing regional growth to our state or, or to locality. So um, I, I may have the details a little long, wrong, but one of the things that I uh, think is an example of this kind of collaboration is the um, investment in the public transportation system in L.A. Uh, L.A. has been really investing billions of dollars in uh, its metro system, uh, both buses and trains. And it's been able to do that in part because it's been able to raise local revenue uh, through increased taxes. It's been partnering with the state uh, as well as the, uh, as the federal government, and especially the federal government, and the whole concept of pay forward uh, in which, uh, you know, the, the federal government supports this development in a way through loans and, and uh, that a lot, um, against, that are paid off against the commitment that is made through the increase in taxes. That's kind of how those loans are paid off. I actually think that's a very positive model. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it shows local effort. Uh, it creates a, a, a revenue stream that against which uh, the, the city uh, can borrow. Uh, it involves uh, federal resources and, uh, you know, helping to do that. Uh, and I'm quite uh, impressed, actually, uh, by uh, the last five, six years, the real progress that's being made in a place like Los Angeles, where you don't really think of public transportation all that much, uh, the number of uh, train lines and bus lines and, uh, and now even bike li uh, lanes and so on that are being built, it's, it's really fairly impressive. I, of course, get the benefit from this because one of the train lines goes to Santa Monica and I can take it to work now uh, in, uh, in the downtown. Um, but that is made possible by this kind of interinstitutional financial uh, uh, arrangement. Jack, you're, you're, you're a pretty good recounter of what, in fact, happened, uh, having lived through it. Um, let me just state, and, and I should have stated this earlier, um, I think it's absolutely appropriate that we start the dialogue and I'm saying this to Terry and the Napa people, um, with the state. And the reason I say that is that in our constitutional structure, it, the state is the one who makes the rules. They create the legislative framework that enables local government to then solve problems. And, and I will argue that, that and, and suggest that in, in a good part of my career, the animosity and differences between the state and the locals uh, of, of the state giving the local tools that they could and then go out and solve problems was limited. But that has changed in the last several decades. And one of them was the ability for us to pass sales taxes. The second is these districts that I mentioned will have sales taxes, uh, you'll have value capture, you'll have assessment financing. I, I could name about 40 different finance provisions uh, that we now can pull together because these are separate governmental entities uh, and, and next of all, there was a provision on public-private partnerships where the state did not specify the procurement provisions of the public-private partnerships. It's a very short and flexible and usable public-private. Um, our state has moved in the last decade, in the last decade and a half, to give local government tools. The, 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 the challenge for us... Um, and maybe we can talk about this in later questions, is how do we help equip 
the locals, both the political leadership and the administrative leadership, so that they can, in fact, use these tools. Um, and I just want to conclude, we've done a lot of case studies on fiscal sustainability, and my colleague Greg Devereaux has been part of that, uh, doing case studies around Southern California. And, and what we have found in that is um, a definite need for uh, both political and public both knowledge of how to use tools and leadership. So I, in answer to your question, I'm not sure that I, I see frameworks that sort of cut across uh, policy areas. I actually think what's happening in places where things are working a little bit better, and I would put California in that category, is that we're trying to solve them within the systems in the individual policy areas. So, and one of the things where we've made the most progress really does come back to the issue of is there some kind of financing mechanism we can put in place where we didn't have one? So in transportation, we've got a $54 billion transportation package that includes raising the gas tax for the first time in 25 years, and it could be a huge issue. Uh, that's a problem for uh, some folks in the state in the coming election, but the reality was we weren't going to fund infrastructure improvements without raising gas taxes, and we got that done. Uh, state leaders are about to announce a housing package later this week that's going to have a housing bond, a real estate transaction fee, and then some issues around streamlining regulations, and that will be progress on some fronts in the state in terms of addressing, it, it won't solve the state's housing crisis, but it will make some steps in the right direction. And so it, in each of these areas, we're talking about financing mechanisms that can leverage some policy response. The LA example doesn't happen without the sales tax authority, right? And, and I think this is a big deal from a public-private partnerships perspective. I'm pretty skeptical about them as a solution, not because I don't think that the um, private sector wants to invest a lot of capital into public sector projects. They do. They expect to be paid back, right? They're not in this for altruistic reasons, right, because it's the right thing to do. They want to be paid back. They need a return on investment. Return on investment and paying them back means you have to have a financing mechanism to leverage the available private capital. And so we're not going to get to the public-private partnership growth we would need unless we address the financing mechanisms. I think you know, we're making some progress in some areas. We're not doing it in like the big general tax arenas, but maybe that's okay. Maybe if we do it in, by some policy areas at one at a time, we can make some progress and open up some, some of these venues. So I'd like to turn the conversation a little bit more back to uh, solutions that we can take away, not just from, not just from fiscal solutions, but generally speaking, in terms of facilitating cooperation across localities, even if they don't exist now, what are some innovation within California, what are some innovations that you see that are happening at the state or local level uh, that we need to bring forward, not just through uh, not just through those governments, but also through institutions such as NAPA or our policy schools at Evans or at Price or so on and so forth. What are the lessons that we've learned that we can push forward and bring this conversation to Washington? Because despite uh, the fact that Washington may not be involved as much as, as they used to be, or Washington might only account for 20% of infrastructural spending, that 20% that of infrastructural spending comes with a lot of strings attached and many times determines how the other 80% is going to be spent, right? And so how do we bring these solutions and innovations from the local level, from the state level, up to the conversation at Washington in terms of uh, broader change across our states and locality? We need funding streams that then can, can collateralize or amortize um, private resources pension and public resources, pensions, equity capital. I mean, there's the, we have plenty of money that is seeking longer-term investments. Um, in order to do that, and, and these these districts that we've created have the capacity, Chris, on a, on on I don't care a small investment. It can be community level. It can be countywide. It can be multi-county. It could be the state. We have the capacity to bring forth huge revenue streams. What we don't have the capacity is to deal with the market risk that they bring. And there's a federal role to play there. And the federal role of of providing risk assurances. And let me just say the. The Alameda Corridor, which is one of the large projects that we built uh, using revenue streams, was built because we obtained the, the, a federal loan, which then became the precursor to a credit uh, enhancement program called HIFIA. 
you have to have an acronym in Washington. Um, but the federal government, by participating in, in buying up some of the a portion of the debt, enable us to go to market. And and the, if the broader the market, I mean, the, on a, the larger the capital investment, or the more complex the investment, we're going to need a, a new and different federal role. Um, and and secondly, the federal government has multiple grant grant programs to initiate projects. If they could do the upfront assistance to and help deal with the issue of bringing financial planning, the financial aspects into planning, which we don't do today. But by bringing financial aspects into plans, we can we can then bring larger investment packages to market. Mm -hmm. And and this is one of, you, since you mentioned NAPA, um, we have a federal system panel, and what I'm talking about is one of these suggestions that is evolving from our panel to go to Washington during this current cycle. But how we how we bridge that that gap between the the actors the actors in the future are going to be at the local level because that's where the that's where the wealth is being generated and that's where the financial capacity is the state and the federal government are going to play different roles in the future i would suggest uh, with napa and schools of public policy is that it's not only looking at those those intractable wicked problems we have now but in the future right um and I think, you know, Napa would be, you know, Napa, be truthfully, has just been dominated really by federal perspective. I mean, they just until recently haven't really dealt with a lot of the local issues. So I'm really encouraged that they're out, you know, leading a dialogue about this. But, you know, the majority of the membership, it comes from a federal perspective. It's that's the lens that they, the majority of their membership looks at. So I think for Napa and schools of public policy to kind of push the envelope, start talking about more forward thinking. What are, how are we reimagining new roles of local, state, private sector to address very specific intractable problems, you know, and, or even issues like data sharing and transparency. And um, I think that would actually go a long way and actually put some, not only the, the fiscal mechanisms that are in place, but how those different levels of government can move the needle and address some of these issues. Uh, you know, um, it was alluded to earlier by uh, Sandy Archibald, the dean of uh, the Evans School at uh, University of Washington. But we have this uh, consortium of universities that focuses around collaborative governance, and we share research and data and information. And uh, I think it would be great if uh, Napa would engage uh, with that group, uh, maybe even expand it or be a partner with it in some way so that Napa could be uh, in some way a, a way of taking some of the research, learning, engagement uh, from that kind of collaboration to the national level. I think that would be terrific. It's a, it's a institutional mechanism by which Napa could be engaged more than, you know, just in a single event right in three or four different places but could actually create a relationship uh, with a number of schools and these kind of programs we have <clears throat> with these other schools also frequently involve practitioners it's not it's not just academics and uh, <clears throat> I think that would be uh, one of my recommendations uh, the other is um, uh, and I think this is true for other schools of public policy as well but we have a really extensive a system of internships and practicum uh, projects and so on with state and local government. Uh, we place interns in the uh, county of LA, but we also have them up here in Sacramento and elsewhere. Uh, and that is a, a very important part of the uh, hiring process and uh, the, especially for uh, high quality people who are in the master's programs to get into state and local government. I've worked on this a little bit at the national level, but uh, it's a it's a harder uh, political uh, strategy at the national level. But I do think uh, Napa engaging around this issue of uh, how to improve the workforce, not only at the federal level but at the state and local level, how to modernize uh, HR and hiring practices, uh, how to use. Uh, the connections with schools, not only public policy schools, but maybe some other schools that train people like social work and law, et cetera, to be more uh, 
interconnected in terms of developing the next high-quality workforce in the public sector. Uh, I, f I worry a lot about this because um, some of the best and the brightest in our school and other schools are, are really going to work for Booz Allen and uh, other private entities, which isn't bad. I mean, they, they get paid more. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, part of the reason they do that is because the hiring and human resource practices in the government is so slow and so archaic that uh, they just get fed up with it and they go into the private sector. It's not that they want to work in the private sector, it's that they're being encouraged to do that because of those processes. And I think that's another area that uh, Napa could work with our schools on. Uh, uh, I think we do better at the local level with that than we do at the state and federal, uh, but um, there's some lessons, I think, that could be learned from the kind of relationships we have with local government uh, and, uh, you know, training and getting really some of our, our best people uh, into all levels of government. I just make one comment on that last. So, you know, even the reward system, I mean, it, it, some don't even want to work for local and state government because... You know, their, their portfolio is that they work for the federal, state, nonprofit. They come back in, their tenure is four or five years. And let's face it, our system, you know, more so at the state, but less so at local government, more so at the state and federal government, rewards employees that stay there for a long period of time because of our pension system. So even if they wanted to work for government, you know, they, they, they lose out because, you know, they can't envision themselves spending 30 years in one agency. And that's how we're structured. So I, I agree. I think that is one area we need to rethink if we're going to attract the best and the brightest, you know, at least allow employees to come in there with a not, not a pension system if they leave before they vest <laughs> and they, they don't lose out for five years. So yeah, It's an interesting thing because the government more or less operates like IBM did, you know, in the 1950s uh, in terms of you come in and, the, yeah, and... Uh, this may be an opportunity to really look at that because um, there's so many of the baby boom generation is going to be retiring, and so there's uh, you know there's there's going to be turnover. I mean, even if there's less hiring, there's going to be a lot of hiring <laughs> just because so many people are going to leave all at once over the next ten, over the next ten years, and it's maybe an opportunity to, to look at this as a particular policy area. I see uh, Liz Hill sitting right across from me. That's a, another uh, point that I think is important. When uh, I remember uh, when Liz, um, I forget the exact title, legislative, uh, anal you know, head of the legislative analyst office, maybe, uh, but there was so much uh, policy analysis done out of that office and the hiring of really top-notch, um, you know, master's degree students uh, uh, Berkeley and us and, and, and elsewhere. And uh, that to me was kind of a model of uh, what we should be striving for in terms of getting the best and the brightest, getting that analytical capacity uh, into all levels of government, Government really. And I, I personally think, Liz, uh, I would in, encourage you to uh, partner with us or re-engage with us uh, around that. So I just want to echo a couple of things we've said with some slight wrinkles. So I um, had a longtime friend, I'm sorry he's not with us anymore, who was a big figure in this Napa community and Paul Posner. Um, and Paul, uh, late in his career after being at GAO, went to the George Mason University and ran an academic program that my wife taught in. And so I got to know him better that way. And Paul talked a lot about this question of whether public administration schools train people that are needed in the actual public administration worlds that they're going to be turned out into. And the rea and I remember one of his observations, and I'm not going to say it exactly the way he said it probably, but was that, that what the world needs now are sort of interagency, you know, cross-silo movers who solve problems, and we're still training people to be IT directors and finance directors and economic development directors and, and the training in the schools. Need, and I think so Napa could do something of that. I, I think... Uh, partnering with some academic institutions. I think I want to echo this hiring piece. Uh, it, the, in my career, I have hired a lot of folks who were sort of in that first or second job out of graduate school. And watching them go through the experience, either of when I'm hiring them or helping in their next, you know, whatever their next opportunity is, 
when they look out, I, I, let me actually just let me use an example. One of the people that I hired, they wanted to move on to another job. We didn't have a place for them. They were looking in Washington, D.C., and they looked at moving into the federal government. They were going to apply for a job with one of the, the federal agencies, and Google was hiring up in Washington, D.C., in their policy advocacy office. It took them a week to file their federal application for a job with, I think, the Department of Commerce, right? But it didn't matter. It was the KSA system, which many of you will probably know well. Um, and it took them 15 minutes to file a resume with Google. You're just not going to compete for talent with those kind of models. So something has to happen to streamline the application processes at the government level to make them competitive. Uh, and then I think there's a piece of this that this equation that actually has much broader application than public administration itself, which is we got to make some progress toward getting toward portable benefit systems generally uh, so that folks can move across professions and have retirement security and worker security. And that'll help public administration types, you know, in government for sure, but it'll help folks in a lot of sectors where they're increasingly finding themselves without uh, health care and retirement benefits uh, going forward. So that seems to me like a, la a larger term, a longer term innovation that we've got a kind of first inkling of here in California with our Secure Choice Retirement Program. It's a small version, but it's a sort of window that's open. Uh, so I'd offer that as well. Um, th this issue of matching our ed educational sector with the employment sector, I just want to cite an example that's going on in California. And I, I believe it's one of the reasons why our economy, to get to your early opening comment, uh, Bill, is doing well. The state really has, over the last 20 years, begun to deploy its, a lot of its programs through regional structures, not just its environmental boards uh, and not just Caltrans districts, uh, but also in, in education. And what they've done in the last decade, and this again was a California Forward initiative, working with the Chancellor's Office, um, is that they've created forums in which the economic development organizations within the respective regions bring the employers together, um, and they bring the educational community together, and they start to share what skills are needed, particularly as we've transitioned our economy so quickly. Uh, and the, the response and the feedback was so great that the legislature started to direct specific amounts of the education budget to, in fact, reinforce this effort. Now, that's in the private sector. Uh, what, I'm, what we're talking about is in the public sector, and there, very well, my, there, there, there could very well be a model in which we learn more of what is needed in the changing public sector um, I'm going to suggest that the fiscal dynamics that we're talking about is going to cause government to change and change probably as rapidly as business. And can we in the educational support area keep up and furthermore start leading that? And maybe you, you mentioned potential projects with the universities, with Napa. Um, I know we have standing panels, and I'm sure that this could in fact uh, evolve into an, an, an interesting initiative, but this notion of how do we match the development of our younger people with the changing needs of the workforce, I think it, it really could be a, a really profitable uh, effort, Jack, and I really encourage encourage you and, and the educational communities to, to pursue it. I have one other uh, suggestion, and, and that is um, there have been uh, efforts, including in L.A., to uh, create, uh, like within the mayor's office or in, in, in nationally in the White House, uh, offices of social innovation. And the goal of these offices is really to figure out how to uh, have government partner with philanthropists, uh, with foundations in particular, and uh, to some extent with nonprofits. Um, you know, nonprofits and foundations have a lot to bring because of uh, the kind of creativity that they bring to the table, the independence, et cetera. But it's very hard for them to scale their programs uh, because they're, you know, they don't have enough money. <laughs> it was, uh, it really came home to me when uh, somebody told me that all the money that the Gates Foundation has spent on education would fund uh, the Virginia school system for about a year. So, uh, you know, 
it's very exciting what the you know foundations like the Gates Foundation are doing, but it's not at the scale to really affect social change. And figuring out uh, how better to partner between these kind of organizations that are pretty dynamic and that a lot of our students actually want to work for, uh, and government to be able to combine that creativity with scale, I think is uh, something that we need to work uh, on a lot more. Um, and there's some good examples of that, and I think learning from those examples and how to expand them and uh, how to uh, match the private sector's uh, nimbleness and creativity with the, the government's ability to uh, uh, bring together huge resources and implement those resources on a scale that can really make for, for social change. I, I think that's something else that I think NAPA and would uh, benefit from, from looking at. Jane Pisano, have there been any studies about bureaucracy in decline and how to make um, something that could be totally horrible, hollowed out, et cetera, into something flexible and right for the time? Any, any work on that or any thoughts about how uh, as, as a group or individual schools could go forward and think about that because we can talk about the different skills our students need all we want, but the truth is they're going to go into a place and that place is going to be restrictive or flexible. It's going to be nimble or not. So how do we get there? We have seen a hollowing out of uh, bureaucracies at all levels, particularly at the local level, actually. Um, and it's really... Uh, I mean, to give our, our esteemed colleague Janet Denhart a nod, uh, a lot of it has had to do with the leadership and the behaviors uh, at an inter-organizational level. Uh, that is, who is leading collaboration between these organizations? Um, I've done some work on different partnerships. Uh, we found that um, uh, using social network analysis, that when the governor and uh, the government actors were central to a network. They were the central node within the network. Well, that was that led to very important outcomes at the individual level. But when you're talking about network centrality, you have to think of it in two different ways. One is it the most dense net, uh, member of the network in terms of everybody is coming to them uh, for an answer, right? Or is it are they central to the network in terms of them facilitating relationships amongst other network actors? And at an individual level amongst that network, uh, we saw the most success when they were facilitating those relationships among other network actors as opposed to commanding the network themselves and being a centralized actor in that sense. And so, yes, there's uh, quite a bit of research, except the, the role of uh, the government actor within these public-private, nonprofit partnerships with government, uh, with the ends of public policy intended towards more unified means, is that the government has to act more as a facilitator uh, than from the command and control aspect. Uh, how they do that mainly uh, has a lot to do with human capital that we touched on at the end of our conversation here. Uh, how do you incentivize actors to look past their jurisdiction? How do you incentivize people to come into government um, and looking to play those facilitating roles as opposed to those uh, more command and control roles? Yes. I don't know whether your work includes um, examples of just within government fundamental changes, but... Um, I, I'm pretty sure we're not going to go to a complete public-private model, but I don't know. Maybe we are. In fact, was funded by the Haynes Foundation to look at governmental entities within Southern California that are in fiscal stress, and what were the causes, and um, what are some of the possible um, strategies uh, that, in fact, could reduce the stress, um, and. Out of those case studies, um, and I and I'd like to just note that Yan Tang was the the, the lead researcher on this, as was uh, Rich Callahan at, at uh, UCSF. <clears throat> um, and out of that research, um, the Government Finance Officers Association um, picked up uh, the concept, and we were 
again funded by uh, another organization, the Lincoln Institute for Land Policy, to take that and convert it into what are the factors that could in fact be replicated so that stress, which is <laughs> caused in part by bureaucracy and, and bureaucratic activities, but it's also caused by a lot of other active a lot, of, a lot of other actions, and what we found was that that uh, the work of Eleanor Ostrom and how natural resources found balance and were, were able to manage themselves, so a common pull research uh, framework, that the factors that allowed successful common pools to be managed, when you look at the case studies in fiscal stress, were almost identical. And that the application of the, of the tool and the instrument could, in fact, give us pathways to enable the governmental system, and not just individual agencies, but the governmental system to deal with stress. Uh, and the GFO, GFOA is now uh, going to apply that on a, on a national level. But I, this, this issue of how we regenerate within the arena of the public service, um, both um, from looking at the entire system as well as looking within the bureaucracy so that we can become nimble. I, th I think is one of the leading pathways out of our, of, not path pathways out of, but enable us to deal with our fiscal future. It's partly just a bureaucratic problem, but it's also a broader governance issue, at least in my view. And, you know, to me that was clear, uh, you, you know, when you looked at, say, the FEMA response to Katrina uh, and the the poor leadership FEMA had at the time and lack of support and lack of funding and then the corruption that was uh, part of the, uh, you know, Louisiana, uh, New Orleans uh, governance system. Uh, it's easy to blame the bureaucracy for that, but that bureaucracy is operating in a, in a governance context that uh, was really not favorable for it succeeding. Uh, and one of the things that I w wish as a as a society, we could appreciate more is the importance of uh, these agencies, their leadership, uh, the innovation that they need to have, and the role they play in society. Uh, in, instead, I don't really, f you know, you don't feel that in the news media and elsewhere that, uh, you know, politicians often like to blame the bureaucracy, uh, even though they're heading the bureaucracy. Um, and the news media likes to blame the bureaucracy because it's easy to do, and and and, and then it's individual citizens sometimes have bad experience with individual interactions, et cetera. Uh, but uh, you know, it, when we did, uh, it was really striking to me. We did a panel on women in leadership in local government this past year, and we had uh, the CEO of LA County, who's a woman, and two members of the county commission who are women. Uh, and the legal counsel was a woman, and we had a large number of students and other people there. And uh, two of it, uniformly, there was just uh, an expression of, "Wow, these people are really capable, competent. These bureaucracies do really important things. They control and are responsible for billions of dollars, and you know, et cetera." And I was surprised by how you know a lot of undergraduates never thought of. Working in government, they they never thought of, you know, especially um, you know, say a city government agency as something they wanted to work for. Uh, and I mean, part of the reason I've been investing as much money as I have in an undergraduate program at the Price School is because of that. Because I think uh, students need to be exposed to the importance of the role of the public sector, whether it's in partnership, uh, you know, with the private sector I was talking about earlier in socially innovative ways or, uh, at, you know, even acting as just a public agency, uh, we need to uh, have, a, a, I think, a, a bigger pipeline and a, and a better sense of the importance that these agencies uh, play, the role that they play. I met a uh, City manager here a little bit ago. Uh, city managers are, I always say, are one of the most unheralded heroes uh, that we have. Uh, you know, they manage important cities. They uh, large budgets. They have to negotiate. You know, they. It's like running a, a mid-sized or large corporation, depending on the size of the city. Uh, but when you, you know, in the news media and in the 
general culture, you know, we just think of business leaders. You know, we, we don't think of leaders in the in the public sector in, in that same way. And um, you know, I've been looking at examples of where public agencies can really do well. And one that you know, my wife is from the UK, and uh, during the 2012 Olympics, uh, the you know the UK government hired a private firm to provide security for uh, the Olympics. And uh, it was a big firm. I mean, they had a lot of contracts, multi-billion dollar. I mean, this wasn't a fly-by-night firm. This was a serious big firm. But it became clear two weeks before the start of the 2012 Olympic Games that they were failing miserably in providing security. They weren't able to hire people. They weren't able to set up the systems, uh, the information systems, et cetera. And it was a crisis. And what the parliament and the cabinet decided to do was bring in the army. And believe it or not, within two weeks, the army mobilized 4,000 people. Security was done brilliantly, and there was no incident. Uh, and so sometimes I think we forget, you know, we, we sort of think, gosh, we have to spend these billions of dollars for the private sector to do something think that when you actually have a government agency right there uh, with, uh, you know, high motivation, high skill, and, and can do it. So it's a very important question uh, and one that I've tried to look at on different sides, but I'm, I also care a lot about these public agencies and the kind of leadership they have and the governance systems within which uh, they operate. I'm feeling very encouraged by this discussion today um, because I'm putting some things together um, thanks to your comments that I hadn't before. Um, you, the, the panel talked a lot about um, fiscal constraints and, and diminishing resources. At the same time, we talk about increasing demands on states and local governments. I've worked for a long time on innovation in government, on creativity in government. Um, Bob and I hosted a group of um, people from Sweden. Sweden is a relatively innovative government. And um, they were talking about all the things that they were doing, which were very impressive. And someone asked, what's your biggest barrier to innovation in government? And they said, too much money. You Americans are so lucky. You don't have as much money as we do. Um, and so if you, a lot of people have said things have to get very dire before things get creative. And maybe we're getting to that dire place where there's no resources, the demands are great. Maybe this signals a new era. I, I have hope again, this afternoon, for the first time in a long time. And I wondered if you could comment on how those constraints, how the, the, the gap in leadership at the federal level, how the um, constraints on resources, the lack of resources, um, how that might help us and, and what we might look forward to. So, San Bernardino County uh, and the Adam City within his county go bankrupt, namely the city of San Bernardino. Uh, was a city manager of Ontario, and I'm talking about Greg Devereaux. Um, and, and a lot of the work that we have done both on this, this infrastructure finance industry and this, in, and this index came out of the work that Greg did in that county. And he took areas that were, that, that were the most depressed area in Southern California and probably the most depressed area, not probably, the most depressed area in California and the collaborative networks uh, that he established within the county, uh, the systems that he um, put in place between the county of San Bernardino and the city of San Bernardino um, so that it enabled them to find a pathway out of bankruptcy. Um, and I could, I could list a number of other activities that, that Greg undertook, and it was those examples that we've used in our work at least to start framing how can we carve pathways forward. How can we develop this? Uh, Greg sits on, a, on an organization called the Infrastructure Financing Alliance, and it was out of that alliance that we crafted the principles at California Forward that allowed us, I think, to create a framework uh, to, to move us forward. So I, I think the, 
what I would suggest is that the learning lessons from the period that we're going in right now are going to lead to the solutions. And I just want to state in conclusion, it's absolutely critical that we bring those learning lessons to the state to put them, in, embody them in law so that we, in fact, and local government can do them. I think a lot of the issues that we discovered in the, in the fiscal sustainability cases were limitations that local government ran into where they couldn't act, and it were limitations because of actions beyond their control, federal or state, uh, so that we, we get the legislative authority so that we can move forward. Um, I, I can't emphasize en enough the importance of dealing with state legislatures to give us the framework and the capacity so that we can, in fact, lead. And then the, the discussion on how the academy could work with the public sector um, and and provide that assistance, um, to me, were two, two examples that I would just cite. So... Um Janet, you know, uh, one other area that we're investing in that I hope is going to do what you're thinking is uh, the value of uh, big data and uh, social media and the Internet. Um, you know, the uh, it was interesting. I was uh, meeting with somebody who's going to become the undersecretary for transportation in the current administration. Uh, I was very encouraged. Uh, he has an MBA from Stanford, a really smart guy, and uh, somebody who uh, uh, really values data and analysis in the designing of this their forthcoming infrastructure plan. But he used to be a senior official with uh, Lyft, and uh, he it was very interesting the kind of data that Lyft collects. Uh, they actually have data on where all kinds of accidents occur, where, you know, the worst, uh, you know, concentration of traffic is at what time of the day, and, uh, you know, just very detailed data because they collect all that by car. And um, this kind of data could uh, substantially enhance the efficiency of the, of the transportation system if there could be some kind of working together between uh, companies like that, uh, Google and others, and uh, you know public state agencies that I think could make the, uh, a lot of what the government does in these areas more efficient. And so I'm actually quite hopeful. Uh, we're uh, in the process of proposing to the university. Uh, I think Elizabeth knows this already, so I'm not uh, springing anything on her. Uh, a new uh, master's degree with the engineering uh, college a school uh, that deals with data analytics and policy analysis uh, to try to train people uh, who go into public nonprofit sector who have, uh, you know, this data analytic capability program, uh, 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 learning capability in addition to policy and, you know, the more traditional policy analysis. Uh, and I think there's a lot of potential there uh, for, uh, you know, modernizing information systems, using big data, connecting with the private sector and the kind of data and information that the private sector has, uh, if these kind of collaborative arrangements can, can be worked out. Uh, that, that's the key. You know, it's, there's not a good framework. Yeah, for doing that, but certainly in this, just in this example of the transportation area, I, I think there's, uh, you could really make, I think, major strides in the regulation of traffic, where to build things, what to do, uh, based on this kind of real time, very detailed, uh, you know, uh, big data. And, and that kind of data is now being collected in many, many policy areas, and I'm very hopeful that. Uh, government, and again, and working with the private sector, uh, will be able to become more efficient and more effective through that. So uh, what I would add here is uh, I think um, part of the reason to be hopeful is that what, what seems to happen cycle-wise is that the politics eventually devolves in such a horrible way that the policy side can come back up and kind of rear its head and sort of say, okay, here's reasoned solutions to real wicked problems that can be solved. And we go through these cycles where politics and policy are sort of clashing in that regard. And so the fact that our politics have become so polarized, no matter what side of things you're on, sort of opens up an ability to sort of present some real solutions when the politics inevitably fails. Um, I think the challenge for those of us in communities like this is to say what's 
wrong, however, and that really is challenging for policy wonks and academics and uh, folks who are in public administration because we were, we're sort of taught not to do that. And there's just some things happening that are wrong, right? Sort of if, if, if you if you think we need a different way to finance a healthcare system in the country, then let's find a different way to do that, right? Because there are some challenges there. But taking healthcare away from X million Americans isn't the right way to go about doing it. And and that's not a partisan comment. That's a policy comment about what's good for the country as a whole. And we have to challenge ourselves to sort of figure out how to navigate some really tricky territory as policy types or as policy wonks to sort of say what the right pathways are and wrong pathways, but sort of steer us out of the political mind. Well, with that, we're out of time. But I, once again, thank you to the panel. Wonderful conversation. Thank you. Thank you.